How's everybody today? This is the last talk of the day. Thank you for coming. This is bring back produ production from scratch in under one hour using COPS, Argo CD, and Valero. Uh, my name is Andre Marcelo Tanner. A little bit about me. I'm a staff DevOps engineer, which really means like distinguished YAML engineer. You can find me on these Slack groups. Um, I have taken the CKA and CKS exam. How many people here have taken these exams? All right, awesome. For anybody who hasn't, um, I'd really recommend these exams. They're really um, practical exams that test you under pressure and how to repair Kubernetes clusters. And that'll become relevant in the coming slides. Also, I'm originally from the Philippines, so I'm a boy, Salat and And I now live and work in Canada, eh? I work for a company named Ada, and we're an AI-powered customer service automation company. We've been around since 2016. We help enterprises resolve their customer service inquiries in any language or channel, you know, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, text, email, browser. Ada has automated more than 4 billion customer conversations for companies like Meta, Verizon, AirAsia, Yeti, Square, and we serve companies and their customers across 85 countries. How is that relevant? So we've been running Kubernetes in production for almost like six years. And I've been there just for like four. So I've seen a lot and a lot has changed. Um, and about a year ago, we had an incident that gave birth to this talk. So picture this. It's the end of the day. You're on call. And you're about to you know, go home log off, turn off your laptop, and suddenly one of the teams contacts you. But hey, we've got a problem. We're trying to deploy our service to this one production cluster, but it's not working. So I give my typical reply, have you tried running it again? And they do that and they come back, it's not working. So then I say, well, have you opened the ticket? Because we, we don't do work without Jira tickets, right? Well, no. So I start investigating, right? I, I, go on, I go on the cluster. I try to see what's going on. And the pods, they're not coming up. They're pending. And it seems like it's been this way for a few days, which is strange. Uh, so the current deployment is rather old. But it's still running, right? It's Kubernetes. It's highly available. And I go and look into our auto-scaling infrastructure. OK, it's bringing up new nodes. That's working. And I go check those out in our cloud infrastructure. Ah, they come up and then they go away. They're not connecting to the cluster. That's strange. Why is it doing that? Not supposed to do that. So I go reach out for our cluster management tool to figure out what's going on. And I'm going to talk about each of these tools and what they are and then how we use them, how they're important in this. So our cluster management tool at that time was COPS. Uh, stands for Kubernetes KOPS or Kubernetes Operations. Um, it's a tool that lets you create its, its own Kubernetes distribution. You can create a production cluster in a single command on any public cloud, AWS, GCP, Azure, and more. And it gets it up and running. And we did this using um, we had the declarative configuration, has like a YAML syntax, similar to Helm or others out there. And so um, we'd, we'd been using it and we had lots of playbooks and experience using it. We create all our production clusters using it. And they're, they're copies, like we have a source of truth and then we create our different clusters. So there either, there's, there's a lot of commands, but there's COPS create cluster, COPS update cluster. So I go in. I run the COPS update cluster command, which doesn't update things right away. It tells me, is it everything expect, as expected from my source of truth, the declarative file? I run it, and it says, I want to do all these changes. Not, something doesn't seem right. OK, that's strange. So I get another engineer on board with me, and we, we go debug it. We're like, what's, what's going on? Why does it want to change all these things? So we go run it on our other production clusters just to make sure that it's not, it's not just us. And 
it is only this cluster. Hmm. Other clusters, they don't want to change anything, but with, with this specific cluster, it wants to change certain files, it wants to recreate some cloud resources. So we go debug some more, and we could, we need to fix it because eventually, if you don't, new nodes are not able to join your cluster, then a node may go away, and a service that's running in there can never come back. So you need, we need to fix it, we need to get it running. So we made a decision. We decided to, okay, let's go ahead, let's run the update. Now, we, we've done this a lot of times before, it should just work. Um, worst that could happen, maybe it, uh, you know, it breaks things, but we can get it back running, right? That's not gonna happen. So I run cops update cluster dash dash apply, and it asks me, do you want to apply these changes? Yes or no? I type in yes, enter. <laughs> the worst thing happened. Pager duty alert, pager duty alert. Oh, I'm on call, oh, I'm already on call. So we start our incident process and we have this process in our company where we get on a call, we call an incident commander, there's communications, there's different people talking to customers. We start the process. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm looking into it. I'm, I, I cost this, it's me, but we're trying to figure it out. So we go debugging it some more and now we're under pressure. Remember those exams? They actually come in handy. So we, we, we look at what's going on and suddenly it's like, okay, um, our networking layer, we're using Calico. It's, it's, it's having an error. Core DNS has another error. It's not coming up. Well, that, that doesn't make sense. It was working a while ago. Why does it not work now? Maybe let's try running it again. So we run COPS update cluster. It's supposed to work, right? Well, it, it usually works and nothing changes. So we're like, okay, okay, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, thankfully we have our disaster recovery process. That's not it, but how many people run disaster recovery planning on their Kubernetes environments? No one? Okay. Maybe, you sh maybe I'm doing something wrong. Okay, so we have disaster recovery plans for in case things happen. We run them once or twice a year. We have a certain scenario. Um, and we use our tools to, to bring back our cluster when they go down. So we, we pull it out, we're like, okay, here's the guide. What do we do, what do we do? This, where, this is where Valero comes in. Uh, Valero is a backup and restore for the state of Kubernetes. It's backed by VMware. Basically, it's like, it reg can regularly back up your cluster on a schedule, including persistent volumes, so cloud volumes, EBS volumes, or whatever the volume is in your cloud. And then you can restore that to another cluster. We had used this during our disaster recovery testing to migrate clusters, to bring up a new cluster. It's basically like getting a cube control, getting all the YAML and storing it somewhere. It stores it in a object store. So, you know, this will work. It, it, this should work, right? We, we take the latest backup before things go wrong, before things went wrong, and we, we start to restore it. It restores pretty quickly. Um, some things start working, but not, not everything. Like our main services are still down. And so we go investigate some more and more, um, but it didn't get, a, get things working. So we had to make a decision. Like when you're under pressure, under fire, you can't really just stall. You gotta talk to your team that's there make a decision, move on, make a decision, talk about the consequences, the trade-offs, what are the options? And of course, we have, we have our, our leaders on the call, we have people on our teams helping us, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we did have a backup plan because we did our disaster recovery planning. We knew that no matter what, if something, if worse came to worse, we could recreate the entire cluster. Of course, that might take time, right? But so we made a decision as a group, as a team. All right, can't figure this out. We don't know what, what's going on. We don't know how it started. Um, it's, our restore plans are not working. Let's just recreate the cluster 
and get everything. At least we know how that works. And so we did. We pressed the big reset button. We deleted the cluster on purpose. And then we recreated it. We recreated uh, using COPS, COPS update cluster. It's real quick. It brings it all up. But it was empty. Now what? Oh, we, we did have Valero to restore things. But our next tool is what brings everything together. So we use Argo CD. We had been migrating to, migrating to it, and we migrated our core applications to it. And so we installed Argo CD on the cluster. And then it installed our main applications. And then things came up. How many people here know about Argo CD? All right, OK. Quick intro about Argo CD, since most people know about it. Um, so it's a GitOps tool that allows you to deploy your applications from a single source of truth. Previously, before using Argo CD, we were doing deployments via imperative commands from our CI service or from a tool we built in-house, like kube control apply, basically. Uh, but we moved it because we need to be more scalable and we need things to be just reliable, not someone deployed something here and we don't know how they deployed it. So we deployed Argo CD and it brought up our main applications and everything was good. Actually, service came back. So we were, we were okay, okay, I still have a job, good, good. No, but everything was good. And it just worked. Well, not, not exactly. So our disaster recovery plan wasn't perfect. Our migration to Argo CD wasn't perfect. We had some services, our main services that came up, and this restored um, for our customers, customer-facing services. But there were other things in the cluster that weren't there. We had outdated guides, um, disaster recovery guides. We had outdated processes. Some things we had to install manually. Some things we had to go find the GitLab job or CI job and click a play button and, and make, get that installed. So there's a lot of things we had to do to fix it after things came up. But eventually we got into its working state and we could stop the incident call. So in total, there was like two hours of total outage. It took us about 41 minutes to delete and bring back the cluster, which was by our standards when we do DR, we give it about two hours. There were many inter interdependent services and we had to figure out what's working, what's not working. Um, but things were good. We were back. Now, what, what was actually the problem, in case you're wondering? So, this is what we found out afterwards, is um, COPS has a state store. So when you create a cluster, it stores the state of the cluster in a object storage. We were using AWS. And, and so we created a S3 bucket for that. And when we did it, we were using a new process that we hadn't used before. Well, not for this. We had a new process to create that object storage and it had a lifecycle policy. Um, Lifecycle policy is after a certain amount of time, it will delete files. And so it turns out that when a new cluster, when a new node comes up, it accesses this object storage and gets secrets and things it needs to connect to the cluster certificates. And so when, when, when we create a cluster, um, it created a, we created with an object store that had an expiry policy of 90 days. Guess what happened 90 days ago? That's when we created the cluster. So in hindsight, we could have fixed this if we knew where to look, if we knew more, if we prepared for this problem, if we knew how our tool failed. Um, actually, one of the maintainers helped us find this. Um, they probably seen it before. And so now we know. So what did we learn through this process, All right? Well, 
first thing is to complete your migrations. We had several CI, ser CI processes, deployment processes. We were figuring out how to move over to Argo CD. We were figuring out how to do things. We didn't have enough time, or we didn't have enough, uh, we had other things that came up. And then we had multiple deployment pipelines. This service was deployed via the old way. This service was deployed via the new way. This service was, I don't know. So complete your migrations. The second is be experts in your tooling. There's a lot of open source tooling that we all use that's all out on display there. And if, if you're not paying someone or a vendor to support that for you, your company is paying you to be the maintainer of that software, to be the experts. And so when you take on an open source software, when we take on an open source software, we have to learn how it fails, learn how it works, and also learn all the bad things about it. Have guides, have training, teach new team members how to use it. Um, and over time, we had accumulated a lot of software that some people knew how to run that were been there a long time and others didn't. And so we had to look over it and look over the critical ones and look at how they worked. Um, yeah. And the third point is to always be practicing your disaster recovery. Now, we had outdated guides. Um, we, we mostly, we did them for compliance, you know, we, we, we went through the exercise, we did them, but we actually had to use them. And that's when we, you know, found out that they're, 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 they're not as, they were outdated, they, they had commands that didn't work. And so what if someone else was on call that didn't write the guide or didn't, hasn't been there a while? So if you're always practicing your processes, if you're, then you have less chance of them drifting. So we learned from this and it wasn't quick, but we fully migrated over to Argo CD. We took the time to do it properly. We took the time to learn more how to do it to improve our process. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like today. Maybe we're, we might be doing it wrong, um, but this is what we picked, you know. Um, when someone deploys, it goes through a abstracted CI pipeline job that goes to our GitOps repo. And then every cluster is running Argo CD and they, they all deploy. Whenever they get the deployment for that environment, they deploy it. And so if something is not on Argo CD, it does not exist in our cluster. There is no more manual deployments, imperative deploys. And we were able to move all teams over to this new method. It took time, we did critical services first and then we took other teams through it. Some teams had to migrate themselves, but we got there. And if, if there was a service that they didn't migrate, well, it must not be that important. But yeah, well, when we moved over, we found some, but we fixed those, so. And being experts at our processes. So now when we spin up a new cluster, we have a single workflow. We're actually on EKS now, but, and we use Terraform to spin it up. And then after that, we, it installs Argo CD and then Argo CD from there takes all the applications. We're using application sets now um, and label selectors. And that allows the cluster, Argo CD in the cluster to pull in what's right for that environment and deploy it. So actually now we can deploy an entire cluster end to end in just a few minutes. Now, this is what I mean by DR is our deployment process. We don't do the process once in a while. We actually do it quite frequently. So now, we used to be really bad at upgrading clusters. 
as you know, there's a new version of Kubernetes all the time. Um, the old versions go out of date, so you have to get used to upgrading it. And with our new process, we made sure we got it really good that we could upgrade all the time. So we always have like a blue and green cluster. Maybe in the future we'll have more. So we recently, just last week, like we, we went from 1.22 to 1.25. Of course, we had to figure out the incompatibilities, but the clusters and all the applications, that was a breeze. We put up the new cluster, we call it the green, and they grab from the same source of truth in our GitOps repo, Argo CD deploys it. And then when we're ready to switch over traffic, we switch our load balancers or we do rated, uh, weighted load balancing. And we've done this already for two different version upgrades. And we just keep improving the process. So the same process we use for creating clusters, for restoring them is, is, is our deployment process. We're always doing that. There is no other, well, we still have backups just in case, but we hope we don't have to use them. Now, it took a team to get here, or a lot of teams, a village. This wasn't just like one small team. This was several teams in our companies, three teams working together um, over a, lo a lot of time. And we're not done. We're going to keep improving this process. You know, um, so to give you an example, we've been running Kubernetes in production for almost six years. Argo CD actually for two years. And to get here since our incident, like last year, it's been almost a year. Like it's took almost a year of work with many people to get there. So wherever you are in your journey, and we're still on a journey. It'll take time, but you get there and it's, it's, it's really good. And we're still learning. I met someone yesterday, Michael, from Stockholm, and he showed me how he set up his clusters with Argo CD and Cluster API, and I learned something there that I probably wanna go implement when I get home. Um, are we gonna do a demo? with real production. Um, I didn't prepare for this, no. So, oh. I do have this repo up that I use for a lot of demos of what it's like to set up Argo CD in one go on everything. Um, this is using a kind cluster. Um, so you can do it on your local laptop in Docker and then it sets up Argo CD, managing Argo CD and other infrastructure services, and then a sample application. It's pretty much the same thing we use, just less CI. But I encourage you to check it out. That's all. We can go. So. If anybody wants to take questions, uh, please come up to the mic. If not, I'm available on Slack. Hello? Hello? I, uh, I have a question. Yes? Um, so um, looking at the, the speed of your like backups and recoveries, I'm assuming you didn't have like too many like stateful applications or like large databases. Um, or may, maybe not. I mean, maybe you did. I don't know. but. Um, or how, what would you recommend if you're running something a bit you know, more stateful, like a large database or something like that? What would be the way, because you know, I don't think Argo would be sufficient because it's all, all it stores is like the manifest, correct? So you probably need something like Valero or you know, it might be slower, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, true. Um, so we had stateless and stateful applications, but our state was outside the cluster. So regardless of what happened to the cluster, we can, um, we can, we, as long as we can connect to our data stores. So you can use Valero for stateful, but for, for depending on how it's stored. But it's a different process for every database, depending on how that's done. Um, with Valero, you can configure hooks, like when, say, when a, how, to, how to make Valero back up its data, data stores, uh, the PVCs. You can configure hooks depending on, like, say, run this backup tool first, and then, like, to 
create the database backup. Um, so it does have a lot of those features. Cool, thank you. If no one else wants to ask a, ask a question, I'll do. Um, following up on that, uh, given if you wouldn't be able to connect to your uh, stateful uh, persistent volumes, um, how would you restore that in terms of using Argo and maybe Valero in combination? Because what I think about is if, as soon as you install Argo and you restore from a backup uh, using Valero, you now have the conflict that Valero as well as Argo want to apply their manifests. Um, how do you solve this conflict? So the question is, if you're using both Valero and Argo and you restore them both, which one would override or which, how, how would they conflict? Um, so there, there is settings in Argo to let you back up, uh, sorry, let you um, override if someone, something else has deployed it um, or not override if something is owned by something else. But typically, Argo would override anything that it, it thinks it owns. So if we use Valero and then we have Argo in that cluster and they're both, like Valero would only run once. You would only restore it once. That's a one-time thing. But Argo would constantly be reconciling the state of your cluster based on what's in Git. So it would override it. So you would basically um, restore from Valero and then install Argo afterwards and let it do its thing. Yeah, if we if we if we had to, but for now, like, because we're stateless, we just use Argo to res get the applications running, and then the state is outside the cluster. If there's any data. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Just a quick question: uh, How would you deal with a whole region failure in that scenario? A whole region failure in uh, with with EKS. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes, so we, we have done disaster recovery um, testing for like a region failure, like failure from one region to another. Th this would probably involve your data stores. So the um, simplest way is for us, we do have like our central data store. It's in one region. We'd have to make sure that's running in multiple regions if we want to cover that use case. So it, it really depends on your business needs. For us, we've considered it um, if it, is it worth the downtime versus the cost of constantly maintaining a cross-region cluster? Um, depends on your data store. We use Mongo. We also use uh, Postgres. It, it really, I think, more like a business decision. Like with your um, time to recover, I mean time to recover. Sorry, the what's that? So, yeah, it d depends. Okay, thank you. How do you manage secrets? Because that's the thing is that if you restore everything, but you cannot access your your secrets anymore. Then uh, what type of secrets? Like to start the application? Um, yeah, for example, to access your data store. So I guess the applications need to have access to the secrets to access your data stores. Yes, true. So you would make sure those can be deployed via Argo CD as well. We have um, one way there is plugins for Helm, Helm secrets that you can encrypt your secrets using a tool called SOPS, and it would encrypt the values file and then decrypt it. Argo can decrypt it at runtime, like when it templates it. There are other tools like external secrets operator that can fetch from external stores like Secret Manager or GCP Secret Store. But as long as you, when you deploy those at the same, all together with your application in Argo, then it'll, it'll pull in the secrets and deploy those. So, the goal is Argo will deploy everything that it needs to get your application up and running, including your secrets. If you want to include infrastructure, you can do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many nodes are in your cluster and how many applications are running on it? Oh, nodes and applications. Uh, so we have several, um, you have different production clusters of different sizes. Um, our biggest ones is like, Sometimes 300 to 500 nodes. We have auto scaling, so it depends. Applications, we have some amount of microservices, some macro services. Um, so something under around 50. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you for your talk. One question for this uh, diagram here. Uh, you're not using anything persistent, right? You don't have persistent volumes. Sorry, could you uh, say that again to the mic? Yeah. Uh, so in this case, for example, if you have stateful set, how would you handle that? Oh, if we have stateful set, and how do we migrate from one to the other? Um, so we do have some services that cannot be run on both clusters at the same time. And when we do those migrations, um, well, specifically, we have those teams. It's a different, we can't have it running on both. So they have to schedule some type of migration period, whether they go down or they have a highly available way. Um, it really depends on the service. But in Argo, we would deploy them with selectors. Uh, we use the cluster generator with, with selectors to deploy only to a specific, like the degree, uh, the blue cluster at the top. And then when they're ready to move to the other cluster and that cluster is live, they change their selectors to deploy to the other clusters. So most of our applications don't have to know what cluster they're running on. They just deploy to our deploy through our GitOps pipeline. Some services, um, we have some Kafka services and, and other things. They do have to know what cluster they're on. They have to actually know the name of the cluster. No, but I mean more about data. I mean, what do you do with the data to transfer between the two? Oh, the data stores? Yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah. I mean volumes that, that you store some data. Let's say like- Oh, so, so yeah, like I mentioned, most of our vo we don't store um, stateful services with their own PVCs. Um, we do have some, but they're not critical. Most of our data stores are outside, so like they're in within our VPC and AWS, and the applications can access them from both clusters. So we, we keep our data stores separate such that we can have multiple clusters accessing the same data store in one environment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, do you, uh, does your disaster recovery plan also cover for third-party dependencies like, let's say, um, Cloudflare or? Uh, sorry, sorry, could you uh, say that again to the mic? It's uh, does, it, does your disaster recovery plan also cover for uh, Cloudflare or any other uh, external dependencies? Yeah, this is the thing which I'd like to talk with more people about disaster recovery, but we have a certain, like say, we have a certain scope of what we would consider a disaster and it may not be the same every time we run it. And then we, we, we plan for that. Of course, there is things like, well, what if our um, CDN goes down? That's a different thing. So um, we have certain plans, some things we have more thoughts about, but we, yeah. We, 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 what we usually consider is like, okay, if a cluster is down or if a region is down, can we move it to somewhere else? Can we mitigate that? Um, sometimes it's like DNS is down. <laughs> Let's just go take a break. You know, it, it really depends on, on, on the business and what's willing to accept. Um, so for us, we can accept a certain amount of downtime if, you know, sometimes our customers are down also. <laughs> so it, it really, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you, uh, talked about like you move the load balancer to the new cluster. Do you do that manually? Um, currently, yes. So when we're migrating clusters, we're, let's say, migrating traffic, we would, we would do either DNS load balancing. Um, specifically, in our, in our case, we have CDNs in front of them, so DNS doesn't always um, apply or, or work as easy. So there, there is like other services, like there's a global load balancing service we use in front of our CDNs that then we shift traffic over from one to the other. So basically we, we, we manually shift traffic over, but it's something we do whenever we upgrade a cluster. It's, and it's like, uh, and we make sure, okay. And then if, if, we, if we see that some, when we're migrating traffic that it's not working properly in the new cluster, we just move back. So it's something manual right now, but we're fine with that. So, so the load balancer service, do you create like new load balancers in front of EKS and, oh. and then move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have two different, like each one has its own environment. Like when you, when you have ingress, we have, a, we have an ingress controller and that creates load balancers in the cloud. And then we balance that from either the DNS or the uh, a higher point, depending on what, what, you, what we use. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, thank you about the GitOps repo. So is it like one God repo with all your deployment into it, or is it multiple ones? Yeah, team? so this is something where we, we were learning from, or initially we were thinking, hmm, should we have multiple repos, one per service, one per environment, uh, one for production, pre-production? Um, what we went for was one massive repo. We call this the, we actually call it like the Kraken repo. And um, it, it houses all our different um, GitOps files from different environments. But the good thing about it is all those commits we see there, we see, okay, someone deployed something here, someone did this, someone did that. Um, and it's all in one place. It's just an overhead of what are you willing to do to manage your, how do you manage your Git, Git repos? And how do you manage access to that? Because what we consider now is a deployment now is a commit to that Git repo. So we have to lock that down. Because whoever has access to the Git repo essentially has, can change our clusters. So for now, it's, it's central, and we're, we've locked it down just at the CI process, um, and those specific authorized users can change it. Um, but yeah, it's a monorepo. And there are specific settings in Argo CD if you have a monorepo. Okay, thank you. Thank you.